Hey, this is four-time Black Belt World Champion Dominika Obelanite. If you guys are looking to level up your jiu-jitsu game with awesome jiu-jitsu courses on mindset, strategy, and beyond, make sure that you guys check out BGJ Mental Models Premium. I myself have a course up there, so make sure you guys check it out. Let's get you guys on that next step in your jiu-jitsu journey. Hey, welcome to BJJ Mental Models, episode 231. I'm Steve Kwan. BJJ Mental Models is your guide to a conceptual and intelligent jiu-jitsu approach, and today a super heavyweight approach, because I'm pleased to be joined by Mr. James Foster, aka 300. How's it going, James? It's going good, brother. How are you? I'm doing well also. You know, like I was telling you earlier, I was thinking if we timed it right, we could probably get you on for episode 300, but then we'd have to wait for quite a while. So probably best to just make it happen now, right? I agree. I mean, it took us so long to get this coordinated. We don't want to wait any longer. We had to get it in now. (laughs) Well, hey, man, your reputation precedes you. Friend of the show, Hillary Van Ornum, recommended a long time ago that I should get you on here. And there's a topic I specifically want to dig into. But before we, we dig into it, Why don't you give yourself a quick introduction? Just tell everyone who you are and what you're all about. Well, I've been doing jiu-jitsu now since 1996 officially, and I branched off from karate. So I started karate at the age of 10, a style of karate that was actually more similar to Jeet Kune Do, even though they called it karate because we use stuff from other styles. And me, like many others out there in the BJJ community, our first introduction to seeing Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu was Hoist Gracie in the UFC. So in 1993, when I saw Hoist, I started to try to reverse engineer what I was seeing him do. Myself and the other black belts at the karate school would get together on off hours and, and try to, you know, practice from bootleg VHS of the UFC (laughs) (laughs) pay-per-view and uh, figure out how Hoist was doing what he was doing. So that was where my passion, my love of jiu-jitsu started. And I made the choice in 1996 to fully branch out and start that journey and have not looked back. We're in my own academy here in the Seattle area of Washington State. I've been doing that and teaching jiu-jitsu pretty much full-time now for going on 20 years. Amazing, man. Hey, if you've been training since 96, that's that's pretty far back. I mean, that's around the time when most people were just learning about what jiu-jitsu is for the very first time. Yeah, yeah. There was no instructional resources, really, and we'll... At one point, there was those Craig Kuka, I believe he was like a Henzo Gracie guy. He had a VHS tape series that was really expensive. (laughs) If you could get a hold of that, you could see some stuff. But when I very first started, there was no books, no videos, nothing instructional-wise. Now now we have the opposite issue today where we have just overwhelming amounts of great instructional information available to us. Yeah, it's crazy. I've talked about that before and just how there's this kind of a like a paradox of content in jujitsu where there's so much stuff out there that it's hard to even know where to get started. It reminds me of when I was a kid, you know, if you wanted to watch a movie or play a video game, rather, there was really only so much stuff out there. It was pretty easy to keep on top of things. But these days, there's so much stuff on Netflix and Disney Plus and Amazon Prime Video. The bigger battle is, where do I invest my time? I I have no shortage of content. It's just a matter of, given this mountain of it, where do I even start with? Absolutely. Yeah, and I feel like jujitsu instructionals are the the same thing. These days, you know, there's so much stuff out there that the hardest part is not finding content. It's separating the wheat from the chaff and figuring out what is actually worth your time to study, right? Absolutely, and it's uh, really hard for newer students coming into jujitsu when they're trying to figure out what they should be focused on, but they're, you know, constantly presented with new information from thousands of different sources that can be you know, coming into jiu-jitsu as a beginner, 
it's hard to find that path of what you should be working on to begin with because jujitsu is so vast. And then when you come into it and you could literally sit on Instagram or YouTube for the next, you know, 10 years watching free instructional content, it just adds to that overwhelming nature of the, the art that we're in. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, hey, something that I wanted to talk with you about here today, I wanted to talk about general concepts to be effective when you're a heavyweight grappler. Now, you're a big boy from what I understand. I mean, I follow your social media. I see a lot of pictures of you doing promotions and literally picking up your students by, <laughs> with one arm. <laughs> so. Yeah, that started, that tradition got started a while back and now everybody wants me to do it. <laughs> I actually started that in the kids class and then the adults started asking me to do it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so how, like, how big are you? I hope that's not too intrusive a question, but you know, what, what do you fight at? Well, I prefer to fight at around 295 or so, but currently I'm, I'm 6'5 and I'm about 310 right now. I've lost, I've lost quite a bit of weight just trying to get in that competition shape again. So I've kind of been focused more on lifting again and I uh, got into arm wrestling over the pandemic and learning the technique with that and kind of put on some size. So now I'm kind of trimming up and getting ready to get back out there at Master Worlds this year. So I'd like to get right back down to around 295 or so. Man, you're you're like two of me rolled into one. That's pretty big. <laughs> Now that actually ties into the topic I wanted to discuss with you here today. Something that we've talked about on the podcast before is that in the in the jujitsu lore, there's kind of a, a bias in my mind against big guys. You know, people always badger big guys about, hey, you got to be safe. You got to be safe. Don't hurt the little guys. You know, take it easy. And big guys really kind of have it drilled into them from day one that they need to baby all of their training partners. However, no one ever talks to little guys like that. And I mean, I got to tell you, if I'm going to be honest, I'm not afraid of big guys because I know that big guys are going to be gentle with me. I'm afraid of the little guys. That's where I get injured. It's some idiot who tries to do a cartwheel pass and winds up kicking me in the head or something like that. I mean, I feel like a lot of the time big guys get the uh, the short end of the stick in jujitsu. And I'm, I'm wondering well, if you've experienced that yourself. Yeah, to some extent, there can be a double standard there, but I really think it comes down to, you know, how you're taught by your instructor out the gate, how you approach jujitsu will kind of inform that regardless of what your size is. So, but yes, I, I do see what you're saying about <laughs> the smaller individuals trying a lot of flying stuff and maybe being a little more reckless, you know, kind of throwing their weight around because they can. But for me, it's always been about keeping myself honest with my technique in that I constantly evaluate, and this comes from having instructors that forced me to be mindful of being technical, I evaluate if, if I'm able to achieve what I am because I'm bigger and stronger than the person, or was it a legitimate technique? Right. And so for me, if I'm rolling with somebody 150 pounds or 350 pounds, the, the technique should work pretty much the same if the timing and the leverage and everything is there. So I try to hold myself accountable in that regard and, and approach it in that manner versus, you know, doing things in a way where they're only going to work if the person is of a lesser stature than me. Right, right. Now, this is what I wanted to pick your brain about here today. So if someone comes to me and they ask me for general tips and tricks on how to fight against a bigger opponent... I got a lot of things that I could tell them, right? I think that this is a very frequently discussed problem in jujitsu, which makes sense because that's part of the lore, right? In, in jujitsu, part of the marketing is that this is a sport for little people to hold their own against bigger people. So it goes without saying that when you market it that way, you're going to get a lot of people who come into this sport because they are smaller and they want to learn how they can be more effective. Right. So we've had a ton of conversations about what to do if you're the smaller of the two. You know, if you're giving up a significant size advantage, how could you tailor your game plan to remain effective against that bigger person? And I think in a lot of ways, that's a conversation that's kind of, although it's very important and people care about it, it's kind of been done to death. 
And so today what I was hoping I could I could pick your brain about is let's flip the script and do it the other way. I would love to know when you are the big guy, what does your game plan look like? What are the pointers for how you you fight effectively when you are a larger opponent and you're in there with one of those small people? Um, I mean, of course, in an ideal world, I guess you just squish them. But, but the problem with a lot of small people is they're so fast. Their hips are so mobile. They're so good at closing that elbow knee space. So it can actually be surprisingly hard to lock in a pass on them. It can be a challenge. Yeah, they definitely have their own attributes that, you know, are beneficial on the other end of the spectrum of being smaller that can be hard to deal with for sure. Yeah. And especially in jujitsu, where we put such an emphasis on completing the guard pass, right? It's not just enough to be on top of someone or to sit on them. You have to clear their legs. That can be really hard to do again against certain body types, even if they are smaller, because people can just be so compact and tight. And if they get really good at playing that game, it's kind of like trying to wrestle a beach ball, isn't it? It can be very challenging to definitely. So what I would want to know is from your experience, how do you play that game? I mean, if you're in there with someone who, you know, maybe you're a lot bigger than them, but you know, skill wise, they're formidable and there's enough of a body type difference that you've got to make some alterations to your game plan. I'd love to explore with you what you do and how you make that work. Well, I'm never going to try to be faster just as the other person wouldn't try to be stronger than me if there's a huge deficit in that area. So if I'm, for example, approaching passing somebody's guard who's a smaller, faster, more agile person, my emphasis becomes the elimination of space. And my emphasis is following a checklist in my approach to passing any guard. And that checklist that I go over for passing any guard, it starts with clearing their feet. Once I've cleared the feet, then I'm looking to clear the knee line. Once I clear the knee line, I'm looking to neutralize the ability of their hips to have mobility. So I'm neutralizing them, being able to elevate their hips to rotate through and do any kind of inversion. Once the hips are killed, I'm looking to clear that midline of the ribs and then advance to upper body control. What a lot of big guys do wrong because they can get away with powering through is they'll go and they'll dive straight for the person's head. And somebody with great hip mobility and good guard retention skills, if you jump straight for their head, it'd be like going from the bottom rung of a ladder and trying to jump to the top row. Something's going to be missed there. They're going to have the opportunity to recover. So that checklist that I force myself to follow. And that's something you can follow regardless of your size to approach passing any guard that makes guard passing way less daunting. Because if we're trying to remember a specific move for addressing each style of guard in the fray, you're never going to be able to recall that information quick enough. And as you know, at the black belt level, if we're having to think we're already too late, right? Yeah. So that's not the, not an opportunity you were afforded there. Absolutely. So having the checklist in place kind of allows you to look and assess any guard you're dealing with and break it down into simple steps and check each step off. And I see again, you'll be a bigger person approaching that smaller person. And just because you can reach their head it's not necessarily a good thing because if their hips are elevated, as we know, we have people that can fold in half and inverts and pummel their legs and end up in all sorts of great positions if they're afforded that hip mobility. Yeah, I have definitely suffered from that firsthand. I'm at kind of the body size where, you know, some of the time I'm the bigger person, some of the time I'm the smaller person. And so I kind of see both worlds. Right. And I have definitely made that mistake. And I remember having to train myself out of it because I would 
see the person's head there. And I would think, you know what? I could probably just take a shortcut and just grab their head. Yep. You know, even before I'm technically done the guard pass, I could probably just lean over them and squish them with my body weight. And the problem is you fight good guys and they're going to use that opportunity to elevate you, to get underneath, to leg lock. Exactly. Yeah, to invert. And, and I went through this phase where I was fighting these guys who were really, really good at that game. And man, I just kept getting smoked by these much smaller guys. And eventually I realized the mistake was I was way too hungry about trying to grab their head and put weight down on top of them. I was not going through the layers of guard like you talked about. I was, yep. yeah, so I would be trying to lean forward, but they would still have their knees up in front of me. So all you're really doing at that point is you're giving them a way to elevate you and tip you over. So really good insight there. Yeah. And my friend Christian Woodsmanzi, I don't know if you've had him on before, but Christian, he talks about, I, I say a checklist, but he talks about it like climbing a ladder. So instead of the checklist, he talks about the same thing with the feet, knees, hips, and all of that. But he, he puts the analogy of climbing a ladder and not skipping runs, rungs of the ladder. So, you know, it's a, it's a great concept and it, it really helps people compartmentalize and not make approaching passing the guard such a daunting thing. So that's something that, you know, anyone can use regardless of size just to make passing a little bit more manageable and less scary. Right, right, right. Now, here's a question for you. Do you feel that there are any, I don't know, positions or, you know, variants of guard or even techniques that would be considered quote unquote, big guy moves. And the reason I ask is because if you talk to a little person, you know, a lot of smaller people can give you a laundry list of techniques or positions that they personally feel are going to be more effective if you're the smaller grappler. I'm wondering if the opposite applies. And, you know, if you're going in there against a formidable but much smaller opponent, do you go in thinking to yourself, just due to the size advantage, I should go for triangles or I should go for head and arm chokes or something like that? Or do you feel that everything is on the table regardless? I see it all as jujitsu. So for me, it's all on the table. You got to realize I'm kind of an anomaly in the jujitsu world in that I'm a big guy who's known for moving and doing things that little people do. <laughs> like cartwheels and inverting and <laughs> barambolos and all of that. So, you know, for me, it's all on the table as far as that goes. But as far as what I would play, I don't, usually a lot of it nowadays is by feel. And that's something that you can't teach. You can't teach experience and feel. So a lot of the things I do, I can kind of sense the path I need to, you know, take depending on what I'm feeling uh, the feedback I'm receiving from my partner, that's what's going to inform my approach. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Makes a ton of sense. And yeah, I agree with you too, that that aspect of intuition is so key in jujitsu. And man, I, I know that's not a satisfying answer for people. I know that nobody wants to hear that, <laughs> right? Oh yeah, because it's not something you can learn without putting in the time. Exactly. Exactly. Everyone wants to have the answer written out for them. You know, here's exactly the technique to do. Yeah. I would say like, there are certain things that are going to be obvious that are, you know, beneficial for you to try. If you're a tall person like myself and you have long legs, I'm like all legs. I have short torso and long legs. So, you know, obviously triangles are going to be good things to learn from my guard and omoplatas and things like this, utilizing the legs and utilizing the natural strength of the legs. But again, you know, everything I do, I'm trying to put within the confines of saying, well, it also needs to be able to work on somebody bigger than me. Mm -hmm. And as funny as people, uh, they always laugh when I say that as big as you coach, no way. You watch some of the footage and see some of my opponents. There's been plenty who have been way bigger than me <laughs> that I've competed <laughs> against in competition. So I always tell my students, I have to be honest, just keep myself honest with my technique as well, because, you know, we have weight classes. I'm competing in there with guys my size and oftentimes bigger. So if there's a disparity in my technique and I'm uh, approaching jujitsu in a way 
where I need to be big to accomplish things. Well, what happens when the other person's bigger? Mm -hmm. Then it's going to be shown how much jujitsu I actually have. So I always try to keep myself honest and sharp in the technical regard and not build too many habits that rely on my size too much of a degree. Yeah, it's funny you bring that up. I mean, there's always a bigger shark out there, right? And I I know that's kind of an overplayed, oversaid statement, but it, it's true. I mean, I used to train with this guy and man, everyone hated rolling with him because he was so much bigger or stronger than everyone else in the gym. And then one day we had some Iranian wrestler visit, just this gigantic guy, and he just smashed this dude. And <laughs> he was he was so far out of his depth because he simply wasn't used to having to train against opponents that much bigger or stronger than him because 90% of his training is with people in our gym who are, are going to be smaller than him. And this is an area where I'm, I'm always sympathetic towards bigger guys is like you said, you want to keep yourself honest and you want to remove those false positives where you were able to make something work simply because you were bigger and stronger. Right. But how do you do that though? Right. Cause you can't control always the size of the people in, in the room that you're training with. If you are the biggest person by far, how do you identify? identify and know if a technique really only worked because of size or if you you actually did it technically sound again it comes from experience but also i think a very valuable tool is to put yourself in a lot of bad positions a lot of bad positions like i'm talking deep into back control deep into submissions and things and then work your way out without you know having the ability to bench press or curl somebody, you're going to know if you're bench pressing somebody off of you. That's a pretty easy thing to keep yourself honest on. If I'm throwing the guy across the room with a bench press, it's pretty obvious I'm not using technique, right? So if you're being mindful of this, you're, you're going to be able to find things and keep yourself honest and accountable. If you're getting extremely tired when you're working in these bad positions, more than likely, you know, you're not using proper technique. If you're using proper technique, you shouldn't be completely exhausted when you're stuck underneath somebody. If you're stuck underneath somebody, the top person should be forced to move. They should actually be the one that are, that are getting tired. Uh, it's not always about you moving. Sometimes it's about using little feints and things that are causing the top person to be uncomfortable so they move. So when you experiment with being in quote unquote bad positions as a bigger person, you develop a, a better technical sense. And the proof is in the pudding as far as I've only ever had my own students to train with in my preparation for, you know, well, I've, I've won three world titles now. So in the preparation for those three title runs, I've only ever had my own students and I don't have any students who are bigger than me. Mm -hmm. So I think there's something to this concept of going to bad spots and learning to be comfortable there and learning to get out of those positions with technique without becoming incredibly fatigued and using finesse versus brute strength. Yeah, I absolutely love that concept. And that is something that is so critical. And man, I remember when I first realized that for the first time, that if you're getting tired doing something really quickly, that probably means there is a technique issue. Ideally, if you're doing something right, you should be able to do it for a pretty long period of time before you burn yourself out. And side control is a great example of that. Definitely. Yeah, when you're a white belt or a blue belt, side control feels like the worst position in the world. And I, I remember at that rank, you know, if I was in there with a bigger guy, they put me in side control. And, you know, at that point, you might as well change your postal or zip code because you're going to be <laughs> stuck there for a while. And I remember thinking, like, why are all of these black belts going on about back control and mount? Side right. control feels like the most dangerous. But then I realized as I got more experienced exactly what you're saying, which is that if you're playing it right on the bottom, side control is actually very hard for the top position to maintain because that person has to keep moving and adjusting and you can really burn out that person if you're the person on the bottom you just have to play it smart so i love that idea 
I just love that about how if you're doing it right and the technique is good, you should be able to do it without getting tired. That's a great way to know if you're doing things right. If you can't just rely on, hey, you know, if you're a little guy, you can just say, hey, if I can pull it off against bigger people, I must be doing it right. Big guys don't have that luxury. So I love that rubric that you gave there. Yeah, it's a great indicator. Another great tool that, you know, a thing that was instilled in me by one of my early instructors, a, a gentleman named Giuliano Prado, when I went from two-stripe white belt through blue belt with him. And the thing he made me do, he said, James, you're always going to naturally be better on top as a big person. So he said, what's it going to hurt for you to go to your back and play from there, whether it be from your guard or whether it be from having people start with you in a disadvantageous position? And he actually made a rule for me when, when I was first training with him to where every round of sparring, I had to start with the other person in my guard. And the only way I was allowed to be on top was to do a technical sweep to get on top. So you want to talk about incentive to get a good guard. If you want to play on top and you're more comfortable there, that was it. So for me, he helped me develop a very well-rounded guard game right out the gate there with that, with that principle. Nice. Yeah, that that's a good one as well. And I like this point that you're talking about where you say, you know, tailor your training, go to those bad positions and work from there. I always love having a purpose when I go into train, having a goal. And one of those, like you said, is, you know, you can focus on a particular position. That's a great goal if you're the bigger guy. And this is something I've actually noticed with most of the really good bigger guys that I train with which is that they usually won't try to play top position against me unless it's clear that I want them to. Right. Yeah, because like you said, I mean, it's going to be harder for them. They're going to have to put in more work if they're the one on the bottom. It's actually really hard if you're a big guy to play bottom position against a little guy because the little guy is going to be doing crazy shit flying around all over the place and you got to keep up. You don't have the advantage of gravity on your side anymore. It is very hard and that is something I've noticed a lot of the bigger guys doing when I roll with them is unless it's clear to them that I'm trying to work bottom position, which I love to do against the bigger guys, but unless it's clear that that's my goal, they will try to take it to a bad position for themselves. That's great. That's great to hear because you know, that unfortunately kind of as people become more advanced in jiu-jitsu, you start seeing individuals want to do that less and less because everybody has a certain standard in their mind when they start thinking of what a purple, brown, or black belt should be. And I notice that people will start kind of going away from that concept when they start to worry about how it may look if somebody sees them with somebody in the uh, dominant position on them. And especially for black belts, you end up with a lot of situations where I think people don't develop their full potential because maybe they need to have the appearance of being the top person in their gym at all times. Uh, when in reality, if we're going to bad spots and allowing our other partner to get advantageous positions and work, you know, we both get better in that scenario. They're getting to work on something that they may not normally get to do. And we're being forced to grow through being in those bad spots. So really, we're just going to continue helping each other grow and level up together. And that's a way to, you know, have an environment that's sustainable to where all the training partners are continually, continuously getting each other to another level. Yeah. Yeah. Now, Hey, something that I want to ask you about is the importance of strength in jujitsu and whether it's okay to use it. Because again, one of the things that I see, you know, people will always say is don't try not to rely on your strength while you're doing jujitsu, which, which is good advice. Right. But unfortunately the problem is sometimes that turns into don't use strength at all. Yeah. Which is, which is impossible. Yes. And also <laughs> not smart, right? I mean, yeah, you don't want to rely on it as a crutch because it is true. It can impede your ability to learn technique properly if you're relying on an attribute like strength or speed. Nobody would tell a small person to never be fast or flexible. 
that's exactly what I was going to bring out, right? I mean, the big guy comes in and within 30 yeah. seconds, the coach is on him and says, hey, don't use your strength. Don't use your strength. But the little guy comes in and folds in half and he heel hooks you in 10 seconds. And no one says, don't use your flexibility. Don't use your dexterity, right? It's it's very much a kind of a one-sided thing in jujitsu that I've noticed. And it's a, yeah, it's a complicated topic. There's several different variables that play there that I would say that when it comes to using strength, I'm usually trying, and I think this goes into the whole keeping myself accountable with my technique, I usually try to not really exceed the level of strength of the partner I'm rolling with. Mm -hmm. And I put limit on myself as far as I want to make sure that I'm placing the technique ahead of the strength. So I'm leading with the technique but it's enhanced by the by the strength when needed. And I think that's important because using strength at all times isn't sustainable. So a good example of maybe putting a little bit of strength into something would be like separating the arms to, you know, finish your arm bar or putting a little bit of that squeeze to get the tap on your triangle. Again, not exceeding, not overdoing it based on the the level of your partner, but those are times where you're definitely going to find that you're just naturally using some strength. I think mean, having that in your mind that I I want to lead with the technique is very important. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that definitely is the way to go. But like you said, I mean, you get to a point where you realize you can't you can't just turn off your attributes, right? If you are strong, ultimately, that's part of who you are. And that's that's not something that you should hide or run away from. You just don't want to rely on it as a crutch, simply because, yeah. like we said, there's always the bigger guy out there. You don't want to rely on it at all times. One, because you'll get tired. And two, there's always going to be somebody you might run into that's stronger. You have to be mindful and, and use it sparingly. But to say that you're never going to use it isn't... Uh, very sustainable approach <laughs> or a realistic approach to, you know, full contact sport. Yeah. And I would also say too, it's not the best for your partners, right? I mean, you got to remember as a smaller guy, you know, the, the reason why someone like me would get into jujitsu is because the marketing tells me this is how I learn to hold my own against bigger, stronger opponents. And in order to make that work, in order to learn how to do that properly, I need those bigger, stronger opponents to give me realistic resistance. Yeah. If they're terrified of using their strength against me, they're not really helping me learn to be more effective. And that was very much a change of mindset for me as I, I got more experienced. I, I remember when I was earlier on, I'd get really frustrated against big guys because I could never win. But now as the more experienced grappler, I get frustrated if I feel the big guys are holding back. Absolutely. Yeah. Because, yeah, I can't learn if my opponent is holding back against me. Yeah, if they're treating you like you're in bubble wrap at all times, you're not getting a realistic look. And then if you do, you know, encounter that, it's going to be a big shock. One of the most beautiful things about what we do is, you know, jujitsu, we get to practice, you know, near 100% the actual things we would be doing every day when we train, when we spar. And there's no question in the back of our mind what those things feel like and, and what it's like to have a heavier person on top of you or what it's like to be controlled or in a claustrophobic situation. There's a lot of things that are unknowns for a lot of people that, you know, get taken out of the equation when they get to practice jujitsu. It takes a lot of those fears away. So if you're having somebody, you know, treating you like you're in bubble wrap and not allowing you to feel a little bit of that when you do you're going to have that shock i remember when i was doing karate we would always pull you know the punches and kicks an inch from the person we weren't allowed to make full contact and i always had in the back of my head like that question of well what would it feel like if i really had to kick somebody or punch somebody or would i pull the punch or kick because i've practiced it hundreds of thousands of times this way and you have that little sense of doubt training in BJJ or training in a grappling art beautiful part is you know we're not punching and kicking each other but we can practice the things we do at a hundred percent and keep each other relatively safe 
and rule out a lot of those questions we might have in the back of our mind. Yeah, yeah. And it's, it's worth pointing out. I mean, I know we've already said it, but look, this is anecdotal. I've never suffered a serious injury rolling with a big guy. And I roll with a lot of big guys. I mean, the worst that's going to happen is they're going to head and arm me and squeeze me and I'm going to have to tap and it'll be annoying. When I get injured, it's because some little guy decided to do something crazy. Like they tried to force a move using speed and momentum instead of trying to do technique. Most of my injuries have come from people the same size as me or smaller. It's rarely, if ever, a bigger person who does it. Well, see, so those people could benefit from this approach I'm talking about as well, right? Absolutely. Like not not fully relying on the attributes and, and keeping yourself within some sort of constraints as far as what's technique and, and what's momentum and speed. And, you know, those are just other physical attributes. Usually you find that the people who are doing that are people who are lesser experienced. And I find when somebody doesn't know what to do from a technical perspective, they replace it with a physical attribute usually. Yeah. And that's a, that's an awareness factor too, that can be developed. And I think most people do as they get more experience, they can kind of learn to feel when I'm falling back on my attributes here instead of actually using technique. And then part of good jujitsu training discipline is identifying when that happens and training yourself out of that habit. But again, there's that word again, right? Experience. Yeah, (laughs) absolutely. If we could only teach experience, it would be, it would be so helpful to everyone. Oh man. Yeah. I, I know I talk about this a lot on here and unfortunately sometimes it just comes down to intuition and there's no playbook you can give someone to develop intuition. It just simply comes from having been in that position thousands of times before. Yes, 100%. Yeah. Now, Hey, so far we've talked mostly about factors that come up in the training room. So, you know, how to be a good training partner and not murder the little guys that you're training with. (laughs) But I, of course, when you go into competition, you know, all bets are off. You want to use every weapon that you've got at your disposal. And so I'd love to know as a competitor or coach, if you're coaching other people who might also have a size or strength advantage, does that factor into your coaching? Do you ever give people suggestions or feedback on when it would make sense, for example, to use a strength advantage competitively? I actually, I teach and I I apply using the other person's strength advantage against them. So what I find in competing, and I'll give all my secrets away here. So I have, you know, like super challenging matches this year is my hope. Like I want to get my butt kicked. That's why I go out and compete. So I'll give away, you know, my approach is to let the other guy show me how strong he is. And I don't match that. I don't give it back for the first couple minutes of the match. I'm just kind of letting them show me how tough and strong they are because it kind of seems to be the nature of when people get fired up and you're in those first few moments of the match. And then I'm listening to the breathing and things and I'm starting to hear things that lend me to believe that they're starting to fatigue themselves already. And that's when I'll start to turn up the pressure a little bit and pick up the pace and maybe start to apply a little bit of strength in my positions to them. Yeah. And that's been a very beneficial formula for me in approaching, you know, competing in the ultra heavy division, going against guys like we spoke about earlier who are as big or even bigger than myself. Right. And that's how I would, this has been an effective approach for my bigger students as well. Because everybody on that initial grip up wants to show you how massively strong they are <laughs> when you're going against <laughs> the big, the big boys. Yeah. You know, I actually love that idea of kind of being judicial with when it's time to apply strength, because you're right. When people start a match, you know, obviously adrenaline is ramping up high and a lot of people get it into their head that, you know, I want to start strong and, you know, come out there out of the gate and just intimidate this guy and put him on the back pedal. Yeah. But there's something to be said about letting a person waste their energy needlessly and kind of biding your time before you, you eventually turn up the dial. Right. I mean, if you're yeah, both yeah. standing on your feet, so many people, you see them just burn themselves out and gas because they're trying to basically turn it into a strength match while they're standing up in neutral grips. Not really a great use of anyone's time. How many of us have seen the boring, typical, stereotypical big guy match where they 
you know, grab both lapels and push each other back and forth <laughs> for five minutes until they both have maxed out penalties and are giving the other person advantages and everything else because they have so many penalties on the board. And then the poor referee has to try to decide who won the match at the end, you know? Yeah. Oh, nobody wants to see that. <laughs> Boring. Not jujitsu. But yeah, you definitely definitely see you know it's something that actually i learned from solo Barrow a long time ago and in, in learning from him and attending multiple seminars and having the the great opportunity to train with him on many occasions and do some private lessons and stuff and he he likes to he told me he likes to play the game of opposites so if somebody comes at him fast he goes slow if somebody grabs him hard he relaxes so he just yeah. plays the game of opposites. If they go slow, he goes fast. If they feel weak, he he goes hard. Like he does that type of approach. And there's a psychological factor to that as well because normally people are used to getting back what they give. Mm -hmm. So if somebody grabs you hard, they expect you to grab them just as hard back. And when you start to manipulate that, you can almost lull people into playing your style of game a great way to slow down fast people yes a fast person grabs you and starts going fast and you just kind of go slow and contain them you'll find they their energy starts to come down but what's going to happen if you match each other then the other person is just going to try to take it another level above and exceed Yep. 100%. Man, we've advocated against this on the podcast before. You should never try to match a person's attributes because especially in the training room, it creates an arms race, right? When you see people, yeah. this is where you see, especially with uh, lower belts, when you see people get out of control in training and injuries happen, it's often because things escalated. You know, one yes. person started trying to turn up the dial and then the other person tried to match the intensity, which usually means using attributes. Yeah. And the other thing along those lines is from a strategy standpoint, they're probably doing that because they're faster than most people and it works. Yes. They, they're doing it because they think it's going to work for them, right? <laughs> and, and so, yeah. Or, or it's informed by past experiences where it did work on numerous occasions. And they're very good at it. So if you try to match it, you're always going to lose that race. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's one of those things where you never want to play into someone else's strength, right? Exactly. Yeah, if they're trying to rely on speed, for example, you can probably assume that's part of their yeah. game. It's different if we're talking about like a brand new person, because again, it goes back to what we were saying earlier about they're probably just replacing something they don't know from a technical perspective with a physical attribute. But if I'm in there with another black belt and he's doing a very pace based game, I'm not going to try to match that pace because mm -hmm. he's playing that pace because that's usually how he overwhelms people and is able to, to dominate. Yeah. So I have yeah. to change it up. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Now here's, here's a question that I have. Do you feel when it comes to training here with these techniques that there, there's any techniques that work better against smaller people? I think we kind of already sort of touched on this earlier, but I would just be curious to know if there's any specific game changes that you make when you're going down weight classes, for example, against little people. Well, I would say it if from a technical perspective, it's it's more of a concepts and principles, like as far as playing playing an angle like if i'm in side control i'm not going to play at a 90 i'm going to be 45 to your hip or 45 the other direction uh pointing towards so on the diagonal playing on the diagonals does that make sense it's hard without yeah. video i could draw like a little teleprompter here and show <laughs> you but you know thinking of the body the opposing points of the body the shoulder and the near hip and the near shoulder and the far hip as opposing ends of an X and controlling those diagonals, that's a great way of containing a smaller person on the bottom who can find those little gaps that would normally be there if you stay perpendicular to their center line on the 90 degree, like a traditional old school side control type of position. Yeah, that's that's a good point. That's one of those situations where given a big enough size advantage for you, 
if you get that person into top side control where you're pinning them, it is easier for a smaller person to snake that leg through and regard. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. Something that you have to be very mindful of and careful of against a smaller person. Now, mount, you know, mount's not as big of an issue, but you do find that that side control is, you know, like, again, like you were saying, that seems to be where it really does benefit the smaller person in finding those little spaces to kind of worm their way out of there. Yeah. It's funny too, because I'm sure people are going to listen to this and they're going to say, hold on a second. You think side control is better for the little guy? <laughs> but I know exactly what you mean, because like I said, when I was a, a younger belt, I thought that side control was a death position when you were the smaller person. But now, once you get comfortable being in that awful position and you develop some fluidity there, it's very hard to hold people in side control for a prolonged period of time if, if they're relaxed. For sure. Yeah, where side control is effective is if the guy on the bottom is freaking out like crazy. But if they're relaxed and fluid and they're not panicking and they're just moving intelligently, it's very hard to actually hold someone there for long. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. Well, hey, something else that I want to ask you here is as a bigger guy, when you're competing at higher weight classes or even when there's a big size difference, what is your perspective on pulling guard? Are you of the mind that we should always be trying to take top position or are there any situations where even for a bigger guy, you would suggest, you know what, let's get it to the floor as soon as possible, even if that means you're on the bottom? Well, are we doing a jiu-jitsu match or a wrestling match or judo? <laughs> like. I, you know, I, I've only competed in jiu-jitsu, so I, to my knowledge, most of jiu-jitsu happens on the ground, right? Yeah, I'd be primarily talking about IBJJF rules jiu-jitsu. Yeah, so I'm being facetious because I know where there's, there's these guard pulling debates come <laughs> up, and it's very funny to me. So strategy-wise, if you cannot get the other person to the ground with a takedown, and they don't pull guard, and you can't take them down we're supposed to watch you guys push each other back and forth the whole time. Like <laughs> me as a competitor, I would rather go to the ground and actually try to do some jujitsu and potentially lose than push each other back and forth for five minutes and then have the ref decide who pushed better. <laughs> so that's a long winded way of saying that like, of course, preferentially, I'm known for my, my kataguruma, my fireman's carry takedown. And so you can find tons of footage of me doing that over and over and over since back in 2007. I think it was on the best takedowns bonus DVD of the Pan Ams back when there was DVDs of the tournaments. Oh, man. So I've been doing it since back then in black belt competition. But sometimes you can't get the other person down like it's not realistic to think that you're gonna always get the person down and and get on top so i've strategically pulled guard in situations where i thought it was beneficial to me you know i i tend to find the big anti-guard pull people a lot of them coincide with people i've seen have to pull guard at some point and then get their guard passed right away. So I see why like they would be against guard pull if they've had negative experiences with it in competition. But for me, like I'm comfortable going there if I need to. And I think you should be comfortable and not, especially for your students, I don't think it's good to hammer it into their brain that being there means they're in a bad position. What if they get taken down and they end up with the person in their guard? Yeah. yeah like, yeah. wouldn't you rather be the one in control of going there and not be in a reactive state, be in a proactive state and be the one who initiated the decision? So I think we could probably do a whole podcast just on that. Well, one thing that I'd specifically inquire on is what about when there's a, a big enough size disadvantage? Because, you you know, if you watch competitions where there's a big weight difference or size difference, the smaller person will almost always try to pull guard instead of trying to wrestle or take down. Right, right. So you're saying if, if I'm the small person... What would my approach be? Yeah. Do you think that the conventional wisdom of trying to pull guard all the time, if you're giving up a lot of weight is a good idea, or is there ever a benefit to going toe to toe with a bigger guy? I think we, we've probably seen matches where it's gone both ways, right? 
like where the guard pole's gone wrong. And then we've seen a lot of scenarios where the guard pole works and they're able to submit or off balance the bigger person. I think a for me, a, a smarter strategy would be like, you know, if you were going to pull, pulling to an angle with the arm crossed like Hodger likes to do. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm talking about? He gets the sleeve grip and he grips over the back and then he pulls. It's what he did to Buchecha in the in their second match. And then he has his back take or his sweep right there off the guard pull. I think that's a smart guard pull for a smaller person to try. If you watch, Mika Galvao just did a match. I think it was on that BJJ Superstars thing or whatever this last weekend. He went against that really big ultra heavy guy who's like probably 400 pounds. And that's what he tried to do. And he eventually took his back off a two on one, but he pulled into that position as well. I think if you're going to pull, you want to have the advantage of having that angle on the bigger person where you have the back exposure. But I think from the feet, I would be looking to get that angle as well and actually use some of those attributes of being quicker, you know, to to get behind, like to cut an angle behind the person versus trying like, obviously trying a double leg or something if it's a pound person on me being 300 plus and I know how to sprawl, it's probably not a good strategy, right? So yeah. I, I think the approach for the smaller person, I would I wouldn't say never try to take the big person down, but I would say you need to look for things like off balances like foot sweeps or dragging to get angles and back exposure, or if you're gonna pull, you're either pulling directly into a sweep or pulling directly into a back take versus just going straight back and pulling them on top of you. Because I've seen a lot of matches where that happens and then you know see the smaller person start to have trouble because they don't they don't have an advantage. They haven't initiated something right off of the pull. Yeah, yeah. I love that idea of not just pulling guard, but pulling at an angle. I mean, that's always yeah. a great suggestion. Yeah. Or if you can collar drag to your pull. Yes. So they're already coming past you like a lateral. And and sometimes you even end up coming up. You know, in off balancing, the problem is it, it requires follow through, right? You know, a lot of jiu-jitsu practitioners are always working takedowns probably as much as they should be. So you, you definitely have to be putting in your work to be well-rounded and have at least, you know, one or two things that you're you're proficient at. Yeah. Like anything else, if you're going to pull it off in competition, you have to be regularly able to successfully achieve that in the training room you know, leading up to the event. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. Well, Hey James, we've been running for a while here. Just wanted to ask you, is there anything else, any other advice that you would share with people, either people who are bigger or even people who are smaller that train with a lot of bigger people, just any good advice that you've got that you think is merits discussion that we haven't talked about yet. I just think my approach is that jujitsu is jujitsu, like regardless of you know, what your size is, I think try to not focus on adding things to your game that require a certain physical attribute. Be mindful that the things you put in your game now, if you're not careful, you know, what the parameters are on those techniques, you could be setting yourself up to have a game or a style of jiu-jitsu that requires you to be young. All of us are going to get older, so... I think attribute-based jiu-jitsu athletes, there's going to come a point where, you know, if they're still training and they're not completely injured by the time they're 40, 50, 60, 70 years old, they're going to have to completely reinvent their game if they want to keep training. Yeah. So I'm a big proponent, and this is something that my my late uh, friend Keith Owen, who passed away, I can't believe it's been over a year now since he passed away, but... He always gave the talk about, you know, being mindful of the things you add to your game and ask yourself the question, am I going to be able to do this when I'm 60 or 70? And if you can't say yes to those things, you need to, you need to rethink your approach. So, and I know Lovato talks about that a lot as well with the timeless jujitsu, which is, which is awesome. I think that's a big thing, like making sure you're cultivating and 
you know, when you are watching those thousands of YouTube videos, <laughs> you're pulling <laughs> the things from there that are going to serve you well as the body starts to decline and you start losing some of that speed and strength and stamina and everything else. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the other thing that I would share too is, yeah, you might be right if you guess at someone's game based on their body type. There are some moves that maybe are more likely to be seen when done by a bigger person versus a smaller person, but you never want to make too many assumptions like that because there's always going to be outliers, right? True. People, people always think that, oh, triangles, that's an easier move if you're a big guy, but you know what? There's going to be that little person out there who is amazing at triangles, and if you get too many stereotypes into your head where you think, well, little person, I clearly don't have to worry about the triangle on this yeah you, man you could wind up getting very publicly embarrassed making a mistake like that so or you could face the big guy like me who can do the splits <laughs> and cart, cartwheel and barambolo and then again same thing right it's like oh you shouldn't be able to do that yeah like, well i can so <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah i mean i i've got partners like this too you know super heavyweights who will do you know quote unquote modern inverted jujitsu and they'll go for bolos and stuff like that and if you don't know that they're going to do that it can be tremendously surprising so for sure yeah you always want to keep them keep them guessing <laughs> right yeah. And I think the other lesson too, is just never make too many assumptions about someone based on how they look or what their body type is, because people will surprise you, right? Hey, still don't judge a book by its cover, right? Exactly. Or, or in this case, I guess, don't judge a book by its weight class. <laughs> yeah. I saw, I saw a funny meme earlier today. It was a, from a comic book artist I follow and it said, uh, it, it showed the guy reacting. He was like crying. And it said, when they say, don't judge a book by its cover. And then it's like, here's the artist that drew the cover. <laughs> <laughs> and he's like crying. <laughs> yeah, that was a good one. Well, hey, James, if people want to check out your work, if they want to ask you questions or contact you, like, let's do the plugs. How can they find you? Are there any instructionals or other things that you want to promote? So I'm pretty much on every platform at James 300 Foster. So YouTube, Instagram, all those different places. I have a bunch of instructional stuff filmed that I haven't released yet. I'm supposed to be also doing a project with BJJ Fanatics that we've been trying to get going for years now. I just need to buckle down and either fly out there or have uh, Michael Zinga come out to my school to film it or whatever. But There'll be some stuff, but all that information it will be shared on my social media. I'd say I'm the most active on on my Instagram, so that's probably the best place for people to reach out, or they can always go to fosterbjj.com if they're ever in the area and want to drop in and train, just reach out to me through there as well. Amazing. Well, James, thanks so much for coming by. As I always do, I'll put those links in the show notes. So if you want to follow James, but you uh, missed the address there, don't worry about it. Just go into the show notes. I'll put the links and you can just click through, find and follow James. So please do give him a follow. He's got some good stuff there. If you want to see pictures of James picking up his students with one arm or you want to see him arm <laughs> wrestling, <laughs> that's the place you go to get it done. Yes, sir. <laughs> and I'll also put a link to our stuff there as well. Most of our listeners probably know, but we've got over 200 timeless evergreen episodes now. All of it is intended to be just as educational and useful today as it was the day it was recorded. All of that is free, so you can get all of that at bjjmentalmodels.com. Again, I'll put the link in the show notes there as well. You can also sign up for our awesome newsletter. At least once a week, I try to send something useful out to everyone who listens and, and reads along, and the general feedback we always get is that it's very helpful. Again, that's also free. If you want to kick things up to the next level, you can hit the same link, and that's where our premium service is in addition to having an entire library of courses that are included there um, over 50 hours of audio masterclass style courses there currently that's also where you get our rolling reviews so we've got just a, an amazing black belt review team if you want to get a second opinion on your grappling or you're looking for some really high level feedback you can sign up there shoot us your rolling footage and we'll try to give you some supplemental coaching so really do recommend everyone check that out again everything we make is available on bjj mental models.com and i'll put a link in the show notes but james man i'm so glad to have you by thanks so much for coming this was a fantastic chat it was an honor and uh hopefully if people enjoy it we'll get me back on here for whenever 300 rolls around <laughs> you got it buddy <laughs> 
Awesome. Thanks a lot, man. And thanks to the listeners too. Always appreciate it. Take care, everyone. Take care. We'll talk to you next time. See you soon.